Hello, hello. Welcome to the second time Essential Chats with Mitt. But this is an essential chat that you're going to want to have. We want you to sit back, relax. Um, hopefully it's 4.30 and all of you have a glass of wine on, and are going to unwind. But we have so much in store for you. So you know that I always start and I tell you what my song is of the day. Well, I'm going to go back to Spike Lee, Do the Right Thing with Rosa Perez and her boxing gloves. And I thought of today, Fight the Power That Be by Public Enemy. Because what you're going to learn is you're going to learn about a power broker, a power broker who was a social worker who um, we have to uplift today because his history is a history that everyone should know that is a social worker. You know, from fight the power to be to just kind of understanding of how you have to go into the system and make change. So we're going to learn a lot about him today through the lens of his daughters. And, you know, I'm not going to tell the story and we're going to hear from, from Lauren and Marcy, Marsha, if they can come on screen with me. Um, we're just going to have all three of them. I'll ask them a few questions. We'll elaborate. We've already did our sister girl, Black Joy. I mean, we are connected. Uh, so we have that going on right now. You know, they have a father that literally, when you go in and you really do some research, you'll see that Whitney Young was on the face of Time magazine. He was on a U.S. postal stamp. He has the President's Medal of Freedom. There's a bridge named out after him in Washington, D.C. He has numerous schools named after him. In fact, the Whitney Young School of Social Work at Clark Atlanta University, where he was the first social work dean, is now named after him. I was telling Lauren and Marsha that if they went to celebrate their father's accomplishments, they would be able to go at, to a a symposium every day because I have I am the John E. Jacob and Barbara Jacob scholar from Howard University and John Jacobs knew Whitney Young, right? So kind of tell us, let's start there um, with John Jacob because he was also at the National Urban League and you know everybody I read about came through that National Urban League. So um, I, I guess I'll start. Um, because John was there after my father's death. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a challenging time for him to be there uh, because there was, you know, it, it was a time when there were big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and John, as opposed to my father, um, was much more, was, was a much quieter person. Mm -hmm. And um, absolutely, you know, very strategic, but did his homework. And um, whereas my dad and, and John was also shorter than my father. Daddy mm -hmm. was um, six foot one. Um, and so I don't envy John in that role, mm -hmm. having to be that transitional person. Um, when my father had cast such a large shadow. Right. But what John did was John also brought back um, the importance of data, of information, mm -hmm. of building a case to then move to a strategy. And, um, and that, was an, that had long been an important function of the Urban League, which people didn't necessarily focus on during the height of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But I remember even when I was about 14, I had asked my father some question or other, and he came back from the office the next day with a pile of stuff that the Urban League uh, library staff had put together to refute my point of view. <laughs> and, and it was my first exposure to the importance of data. And, and John 
understood that. Right. So he was able to kind of move the movement um, in that direction. Since you spoke first, Marcy, so why don't you, Marcia, why don't you introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about all of your accomplishments? Because you are an educator. And, and I, I, I said earlier, a social worker, because the work that you do in uplifting people to be in school and stay in school. So please introduce yourself. Um, so, yes, Marcia Cantarella. Um, and uh, my, my path actually is, is very connected, I think, to things that, um, that my father helped have happen. So after I graduated from college, Renmar College, where my father was my commencement speaker, then I ended up at Avon Products helping to build a corporate responsibility program, which was a new phenomenon in the private sector, which again was an outgrowth of the impact that my dad had on the private sector um, and helping to you know, move the needle in terms of equal opportunity in the company and corporate philanthropy. And so I did that for a long time. I then moved into marketing for a while and then I left and ended up um, in higher education at, at NYU and felt at home because I'd grown up on campuses. I'd grown up on the Lincoln Institute campus where my father had grown up. I grew up on the Atlanta University campus when dad was a dean at the School of Social Work. So being at NYU felt comfortable, felt familiar. I ended up working with uh, students of color to make sure that they graduated, that they excelled, which they have done extraordinarily. Um, and then I, somewhat ironically, after I had finished my PhD, um, which I did while working full time, as my Aunt Eleanor, daddy's sister, had done right. when she was coming along, um, I ended up at Princeton. Uh, where I worked for Nancy Malkiel, who was the author of the first biography of my father. Okay. Um, and then ended up finally where I, I've been now at Hunter. Oops. And um, at Hunter, I've, I was a dean, but now I co-direct the Black Male Initiative Program. And then I wrote a book on navigating college because out of all of my experiences, I saw... Um, you know, the challenges that first gen and students of color faced. Okay. Well, let's talk with your younger sister, Lauren. <laughs> Lauren, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Um, you're out there in Colorado and doing, you were the first African-American woman to lead a foundation. Um, let, let's just talk about what, what you do for a minute. Well, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you to you, Mitt, for having me. And this is the first time that Marcia and I have ever had this kind of a conversation, which just goes to show um, your persuasion as a leader to get both of us to do this. Um, you know, my journey um, from the time of my father's death, I was 17 when daddy drowned off the coast of Nigeria. Um, and a series of other events that we can talk about uh, later, I'm more than happy to discuss. But ultimately, although I had attended Swarthmore College, I didn't graduate. And uh, from a social work perspective, I really want to honor and acknowledge the fact that had there been uh, on campuses or in the early 1970s, uh, social workers and those who could have recognized uh, the PTSD, the trauma with which I was dealing, um, things might have been different. However, that was not the case. So I moved to Colorado. One of the things that I learned from my father was a willingness to take risk. Um, for each of us, ironically, it was oftentimes in the water. Um, that was something that we shared and that he should have drowned has always been an interesting um, kind of serendipity of his love for the water mm -hmm. at the same time. But upon moving to Colorado, I was fortunate to actually connect with a Whitney Young Foundation fellow 
who was at the University of Colorado, Denver, in their communications department. And she talked me into going back to school. I had subsequently married and I was working for a television station in an entry level position. And I, while like Marcia, I finished my bachelor's while working full time at the television station and then had the distinct um, luck, really good fortune of hosting and producing a number of shows on commercial television and then on public television as well. Uh, ended up in the mayor's office as the first press secretary for Mayor Federico Pena of Denver and met someone by the name of Swanee Hunt, now known as Ambassador Swanee Hunt, who was just starting uh, a, a really significant foundation um, that she was choosing to focus on grassroots grant making and very much so uh, on equity work, although that wasn't the name that we may have used at that time. But our grant making was deeply committed to communities of color and to women. Mm -hmm. And through that opportunity, I found a passion for something. And the irony is with that, that Swanee is the youngest daughter of H.L. Hunt out of Dallas, Texas. We came from two diametrically opposed backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, she had been a Goldwater girl, uh, <laughs> younger, and decided to name her foundation, the Hunt Alternatives Fund, as an alternative to um, the previous Hunt legacy. Mm -hmm. So uh, ultimately, uh, I, I became president of Hunt Alternatives Fund, then I ran another private foundation was senior uh, VP for the largest community foundation, and then circled back to the Women's Foundation, where I'm president and CEO now and had served on the board in the 1960s. Wow, what a story. So every tree has roots, and your roots go very, very deep. Uh, I wanted to just kind of go back to Whitney Young Sr., <laughs> Whitney Young Sr. and Laura. I mean, the, the two of them, they met at Lincoln Institute. And I'm going to have you tell, tell our audience, what is Lincoln Institute? Um, you know, I, I kind of, I know that your great grandmother had the apple of her eye was your dad. You know, those mothers that raised those daughters and always coddle those sons, right? But, but tell us a little bit about them because, you know, he was in world, your grandfather was in great grandfather's World War I, went off, came back, and they did some phenomenal things. Now, everyone remember, this is during the days of Jim Crow, and this was Kentucky. So this was not something where when sometimes we say it's a challenge. This was where covert racism was loud and strong. And Laura Laura Young did not play with anybody. You didn't play with her. So tell us a little bit about, about them. Absolutely. You did not, actually, you did not play with either of them, although my grandfather was sort of the, the quieter, um, you know, a quiet strength um, compared to, to his wife, to whom we call, everyone called Mother Dear. Mm -hmm. um, so Mother Dear um, was an absolute force and uh, as was he, he ran Lincoln Institute, which was meant to be a school to train young students of color to be janitors and cooks and work on farms and all of the things that the white funders thought were appropriate jobs for, uh, for young people of color. And uh, since most of the time they were not around, um, you know, they'd show up for a board meeting a few times a year. Um, my grandfather actually ran a covert college prep program. Mm -hmm. And so the curriculum was a college prep curriculum. Those students, and I actually have met a couple of the, the remaining students who graduated from, from Lincoln, um, they all went off to college as did my father and, and his sisters, who were also graduates. Mm -hmm. Mother Dear was the one who made sure that um, everything ran smoothly and that we were all well-groomed, as you see in this photograph. 
Um, she taught me how to shake hands and look people in the eye. Um, you know, you did not mess with her, but at the same time, I remember actually going with her when she would go out into the community to deliver clothes or food to people who were shut in or indigent, regardless of race. Um, I understand from, from my aunts um, that she would also, when she went to Shelbyville, if they needed to go to the bathroom, uh, she would use the ladies' room, which was the white ladies' room. And nobody ever challenged her um, because she said she was a lady. <laughs> she wasn't. Um, so nobody messed with her. She also did become the first black postmistress, um, the second black postmistress in the country. Um, and I remember helping her sort stamps in the, um, in the little post office. Um, and, and, you know, my grandparents raised these extraordinary kids. Um, Arnita and Eleanor and Whitney each have, have ex amazing stories of their own accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So one was also a social worker, right? That also went to, well, actually your, your dad was valedictorian of his class. One of your yes. aunts was the salutatorian of her class. Um, and then one went off to be a social worker. And one, I understand even Lauren even flew, right? Um, was a, in, in aviation. Arnita. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Arnita. You know, the other thing that I would add, um, you know, to what Marcia said again, because I was younger. So when we would spend summers at Lincoln Institute, we would drive from Atlanta uh, to Kentucky in our blue and white Chevy, um, you know, at that time with food packed in the back, no seatbelts, Marsh and I bouncing around, my probably being somewhat annoying. But what I, re my greatest memories of Lincoln were, now I understand the words community, mm -hmm. uh, that the, the sense of the staff that lived on campus of the students, I saw philanthropy as Marsha just described, uh, my our grandmother, and we forget that philanthropy has always been a part of the black tradition mm -hmm. that we have always given, whether they are rent parties or food or sharing child care. And within the community of Lincoln Institute, as I would run around, oftentimes a muck, at a little business, I would sell these rocks that I would find. <laughs> I would find these wash rocks them, on the side wash them. Oh, they were wash them and sell them for a penny. I had a little side hustle hey. and whatnot that was going on. <laughs> but I could go anywhere and they knew I would be safe. And this mm -hmm. was a large, sprawling campus mm -hmm. that I would be watched out for by students, by faculty. And it wasn't just because we were the president's grandkids. Right. It was true for any child mm -hmm. that had happened to be on that campus, living on that campus. And we had friends for many years who lived on the campus. Wow. So we climbed trees and chased the cows and, you know, they pushed me around in the buggy and <laughs> the snakes and all that stuff, you know, caramel cake. Like it was just, it was heaven as wow. a child mm -hmm. to have all of that space. And I think the other thing is, um, yes, it was a college prep curriculum, but it was STEM. Agriculture right. is STEM. Right. It was right. engineering. It was science. It was technology. Right. All of that equipment that they were working mm -hmm. on, using math skills um, to be able to calculate how to plow the fields or, wow. you know, grow the cows or whatever uh, might have been necessary. But then at night, Marcia, do you remember we would watch those scary movies? <laughs> um, out in the fields, right, you know, right, 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 they would right. have, you know, movie night out in the fields and it'd be Wolfman or whatever. And all the big kids would leave me behind and I'd be <laughs> screaming and crying, running after uh, and whatnot. But, but, but that but community the, is my strongest memory. It was exactly. food, it was laughter, it was people. Right. Well, and, and, and part of that, um, just, you know, a little bit more on, on the academic side, I, I'm a bookworm in case mm -hmm. you can't tell by looking at my background right. here. Um, so, <laughs> so, 
that that's just the tip of the iceberg right. of, of what's what's here. Um, uh, Aunt Eleanor, who had a library degree, um, was a librarian, and I used to hang out at the library. It was not an inconsequential library. Right. It was a a well stocked library for those students. Mm -hmm. um, and and in terms of what Lauren was saying about community. I remember there was a little girl who had this horrendous affliction um, and it was really kind of scary, creepy. Okay. You know, um, but mother dear would make sure that we visited her, that the little girls, that we would go and visit her and spend time with her. And, and there was a, I guess the parent of a member of a faculty member, um, this woman must've been a hundred years old, but we had to go visit her as well. Right. Right. Not that, you know, at, at whatever age, 10 or whatever, that we loved it, but but it was an expectation. It is mm -hmm. what you did. Right. And and that's that's what I'm talking about, those roots, because then your dad went in your mom, grandma, they went off the, the, your dad came along and he went to Kentucky State, right? Um, they all did. They, and now let me tell you, but let's not forget your grandmother, right? Um <laughs> Spelman, I found her a little right? I'm going to be honest. Mother dear is a little terrifying to me. Of course, all of our grandmothers are terrifying. terrifying to everybody. everybody. She, she everybody was grandmother. she was formidable and right. and I mean kind, kind, right. kind. When I say right. terrifying, um, the kindness, but but the the way she held herself right. and carried herself. You know, there's there's a picture of all of us as a family, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, as Marcia said, she and our cousin Bonnie were perfectly dressed. And I was, I refused to stand up. I must have been like two or three. Right. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And I refused to get off the ground. You can see my mother leaning over, looking at me like, girl, you better. But I know what she was saying. Wait till your grandmother gets a hold of you. <laughs> but, but, Wait till your grandmother's going to give you a talking to. Right. But when you look back, but when she, you she would, back, she would, I, I would write thank you notes for gifts, and right. Mother Dear would send them back corrected. Exactly. <laughs> but see, that that's the story of a narrative that has to be told because although we we there were separate but equal, most people, a lot of people, white people, think that we were depressed. That we, you know, that, that 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 life was horrible. And here, Mother Dear was letting you know that wow, we're setting the standard. Um, you are going to be proper. We can handle anything. And they did. I mean, that's that's the part of the story that's so enriching because then here comes their children, and and all three of them, college graduates, and all three of them brought change to America. I mean, all of them did social work. I mean, um, so, so tell me a little yes, bit. Yes, about. yes and no. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, when, when um, uh, Aunt Anita graduated from college and, and, you know, she and daddy essentially went to war. Um, uh, daddy, you know, enlisted and, and was in the army. Um, but Arnita, mm -hmm flew planes for the Red Cross and right. was trained by Tuskegee Airmen. There were not a whole lot of right. <laughs> black what? women doing that. Right. Um, yeah. And when I when I earned my my doctorate and I was in my 40s and I was working at NYU full time. Um, and I knew I could do that because Aunt Eleanor had done that. Mm -hmm. And she was the first black dean at the University of Louisville. Mm. She earned her doctorate working full time <laughs> um, while she was, you know, while she was doing it. But Mother they were, Dear, they were yeah. absolutely role models. Right. Absolutely yeah. role models. And, and that was all with Mother Dear and Whitney Young and, Senior's influence, yes, right? Yes, old granddaddy was um, such a gentleman, such mm. a, such a classic, such a, a kind. I mean, both of them were just so kind. But I think even though... Um, my path became more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it took me seven years. I can't even remember to finish my BA. And then I was just kind of done. Mm -hmm. But I know that I would have been honored and respected for the values that with which I continued to live oh, my life. So, um, you know, I've always made it clear to 
to my kids that it's it's about who you are ultimately mm-hmm. and how you treat others and how one gives to others. So daddy was a natural social worker. Oh. He was not an academic mm-hmm. um, per se, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. That was not, he was going to be a doctor and mm-hmm. that didn't work out so great. Right. And, you know, there were some things. No, he he got <laughs> uncomfortable pulling my teeth. He didn't like the sight of blood. Right. So, right. Yeah, yeah, that there were, there were a variety of reasons why that didn't work out. But watching his natural affinity for humanity mm. under any circumstance is the other piece that really stands out for me about, about daddy, whether, you know, it was with small children or, you know, the elders within our community, his sense of seeing people, looking them in the eye, as Marcia said earlier, he had learned early that you look people in the eye and that you listen to them mm-hmm. and that you treat them with respect and also humor. Wow. Um, I think it's not surprising that Marcia and I have similar laughs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, 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 that is that the joy of it all was also a big part of our lives. Right. There was right. joy. But that was also a strategy mm-hmm. for him. Right. And that, um, and, yeah. Wow. He, yeah. You know, particularly when he was at the Urban League and dealing with the with the private sector, um, essentially what he did was a charm offensive, mm-hmm. right? And he would play to whatever the needs of the companies were, mm-hmm. the interests of the individual, of the CEO he was connecting with. Um, you know, he, he had always loved sports. He was an athlete himself. Um, so having those conversations about, you know, about sports, um, he became a good friend of um, Steinbrenner of the Yan- of the Yankees. And, and there has been a Whitney Young football classic as a result of that relationship. Um, uh, I am sure that his relationship with Lyndon Johnson was predicated probably on, you know, um, shot of bourbon. Tell some tall tall tales, <laughs> right. and now let's 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 do the war on poverty, right? Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. right. Rob, uh, Rob Roy on the rocks. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but you mentioned Jim Crow, Mitt, and I right. think that's an important element. It is because I was born in '53, and you know, Marcia is seven years older than me. So when we talk about living in Atlanta or even driving to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. That was the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. Now, Marcia and I've had conversations. I have no memory until we moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts of seeing a white person. Mm -hmm. I literally just don't have a memory between Lincoln and the small community by Atlanta University on Beckwith Street, where mm-hmm. Julian Bond lived next door. And, oh, wow. um, His sister that. gave me all her books. Yeah, and he taught <laughs> me to tie my shoes. Um, uh, but, but it was a very segregated environment in my memory. Mm-hmm. And yet Daddy was able to take that and then cross you know, the, uh, this bridge into the corporate sector, right. but it was with purpose. I think the right. word strategy, it was about jobs. It was about freedom. It was about education. It was about green power. Right. I found myself, and I've been, Marcia and I've never talked about this, but I think that daddy would have been a Black Lives Matter guy. Mm. Oh, definitely. I have no yeah. doubt about right. that, that yeah. Black right. Lives Matter, and that is why... Um, we need to have not only a seat at the table, but if you don't have a seat, then we're going to build a bigger table mm-hmm. and we'll bring our own chairs right. um, so that we could be fully engaged in the economy, that we should be safe. We should not fear for our lives, mm-hmm. that we should have education. We should have economic stability. And, you know, the letter that daddy wrote to our mom Um, coming from World War II, uh, expressing fear for the soldiers that he had helped lead Mm -hmm. when in an all-Black troop with white, um, you know, authority officers above them that he was navigating. But in this letter, his fear was, 
And it proved to be true. The GI Bill was not serving them. Mm-hmm. That would not serve them. They were returning back to the Jim Crow South. Right. And that history is what he fought because Black Lives mattered. Most definitely. At, at, at the same time, um, I mean, I think those years in the military taught him a lesson that, that he carried, which is he found he, he could navigate the space between the black and white community mm-hmm. um, and, the, and the officers. In fact, um, apparently uh, one of the sergeants with whom he had initially had the biggest battles, one of the white sergeants, um, ultimately asked daddy to be his best man at his wedding. Oh. Um, when they were in Minnesota and daddy became head of the Urban League in St. Paul, that's when he started using data. Mm-hmm. to make his case. So he would visit a department store, count the traffic of pe- black people and white people, and then go to the, the management and say, you know, you can increase your business if you increase the number of sales. Right. You know, so he, he became very data-driven and very strategic. Um, Lauren, you were saying in Atlanta, um, he actually, we actually had ties to the white community in Atlanta. Yeah, we became Unitarians, but right. I have we, no we, were, we were we were Unitar- we were Unitarians no, starting in, in in Omaha. Your father um, broke a lot of uh, broke. Always would go in where there was a segregated and a Unitarian church was one, <laughs> and he and his wife went in there and they changed the whole thing. And didn't they refuse to go? They were having a picnic, and he was like, "No, we're not going because." And and you you, you know what he did is 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 used his social work skills, which came natural, right? Mm-hmm. And right. Were natural. I mean, because I even heard, I mean, I even read with when he was a sergeant in the army, he, he became a sergeant, electrical engineering, yep. right? And that's kind of how he did that. But he was the one that was the broker between the black troops and the white troops. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So he ca- and so that's really where that okay. Marshall Plan stuff came from. You know, like, wow, we have to bring equity. And he wanted to make sure that black people had access. And so he Absolutely. had, and, and let me just, let me just, I, I mean, let me just, you have to understand that I'm enamored by y'all. I'm going to have y'all sign, sign, sign oh, something. Don't. Don't, don't. I'll turn okay, on my camera if you keep that up. We'll have that drink together. That's what we're going to do, right? But, um, no, seriously, he was in the White House with Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. Voting rights. When you go back and you look at all of those things that were passed, Whitney Young was pivotal on that, right? So, so tell me about this man that could walk in and out of the White House and, and, and a part of the big six. And so we can talk about the big six. And I think it's important that people know that the big six represent SNCC, CORE, the Brotherhood of, of um, Sleeping Car Porters, SCLC, and which one am I forgetting? NAACP. And those individuals, and then also with Dorothy Height, the Negro Council of Women, right? I yes, mean, yes. they work yep. together yep. to bring change, right? And, and as we, we talked about early, they, 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 didn't all, they, they didn't all live together, but they work together, right? Tell us what you would say now as you, you, you talked about Black Lives Matter, and tell us where social work should be in all of this. Help us help us reimagine what your father yeah. would want social work to do at this time. I think you know, Lauren I think, and I will have two different yeah. um, lenses. Okay. Um, all right, that's perfect. Lauren's on the, on the service delivery philanthropic side, right. and I'm on the education side. And, and so I think we both see that question. Lauren, why don't you start? Oh, uh, either way. But, you know, I think right now I I find myself thinking of my father often, as I mentioned earlier, um, maybe before the broadcast began, because I was only 17 when he died. I never had adult conversations Mm -hmm. and I find myself wanting to channel him. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking now about this covid pandemic, about the reckoning that's happening around race uh, that has been accelerated because of technology. Let's be honest, the reckoning has been ongoing. The protest has been ongoing uh, for hundreds of years. 
but I wonder what he would have said and done. And I remember his saying, uh, and I had to see it on film, but I don't care about how white people feel. I care about what they do. Mm -hmm. So I think in the corporate arena, he would also be saying to all the people who are putting out statements, you know, real quick in support of, of racial equity. So what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. Who are you going to put on your board? Who, how are you going to hire and retain people? Um, how are you going to provide childcare for women who are your employees or allow for flexible uh, work opportunities? How are you going to use your resources to provide vaccines in low-income communities? Um, what are the policies as we're going through this COVID relief bill? He'd be all up in that, mm -hmm. um, all well, up at, in that. <laughs> at the same time, I think he would, he would ask those questions, but in his hip pocket, he would have suggestions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when, when um, Johnson was, wanted to do the war on poverty, Daddy's book, To Be Equal, essentially laid out the blueprint, mm -hmm. answered that question, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he didn't necessarily just kind of leave these guys hanging in terms of what needed to be done. He even took his whole board, the Urban League board, put them on a bus and took them to Harlem and Bed-Stuy in the 60s mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, to, to show them this is the waste of, an, of, of human capital. Right. Um, so I think he would have been very strategic. And um, and so kind of speaking from the standpoint of, of an educator, um, I think we we need to be clear with young people um, about what their capacities are and lift up the role models. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've told students, Google black and in, black inventors. Mm -hmm. Right. Just Google black like inventors. That. And you will find an array of people that you had no idea that they did the things that they did, which are part of our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And you do a deeper dive into any field of endeavor because you had, you know, let's just take Lincoln Institute. You know, these students who graduated with my parents from Lincoln Institute, Ursa Poston, mm -hmm. who was the first black um, vice chair of the Federal Merit Protection Board. Um, Harvey Russell was part of their class. He was the first black vice president of a major corporation. Start multiplying that, right? And there are all of these untold stories who are essentially role models. But yeah. our kids, are, you know, our young people are never exposed to those because of the textbooks, because the professors don't know those stories. Um, so there's, you know, there is so much to do. Right. <laughs> so yeah. time. You know, one of the things, Mitt, that struck me is you showed that picture. Mm -hmm. Kids don't know who A. Philip Randolph was. Exactly. Right? right. Right. And and when they think of the March on Washington and, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King's role at the march was profound. Mm -hmm. There's right. no question. But A. Philip Randolph was the actual um architect, the brain, you know, mm -hmm. uh, inspiration, and Baird Rustin, right. uh, James Baird Rustin. Farmer, right. Roy Please. Wilkins, um, young John, John Lewis at that time, you mentioned right. Dorothy Height, but right. I also, I worry a little bit about a culture of exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of Amanda Gorman, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, Amanda is, is extraordinary, mm -hmm. but there are thousands exactly. of young yes. black women yes. who have yes. extraordinary talent. Right. And we tend to want to lift the one right. exactly. um, and, and to create this sort of worship for them. We need to tell the story of all of the sheroes and the heroes of mm -hmm. our community. When I think in the pandemic, the fact that I have a job, I have insurance, I'm in my house, I have food, all those things. I am warm today. Mm -hmm. There are women and families out there, single moms, back to social work, mm -hmm. making a way out of no way. Exactly. Right. Trying to figure out with one computer, if in fact they have internet access, mm -hmm. how to perhaps handle their job online and educate um, their children at the same time, potentially with one laptop. Mm -hmm. When it comes to social work, 
in the coming years, the mental health stress oh. that is going to be needed. Social workers play multiple roles mm -hmm. in our communities and in our society. But that MSW, having social workers of color mm -hmm. who are going to be able to address the post-traumatic stress. Um, I was derailed by um, a violent rape attempt in a foreign country mm -hmm. uh, where I didn't speak the language. I was only 16. Um, I was on crutches. I was black. I was American. But ultimately, my parents were able to come get me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and then the loss of my father in some, uh, in an 18 month period mm -hmm. derailed me, mm -hmm. but I had the privilege of knowing about the kinds of resources. It took me a while and the black community has got to get over this. Right. It took me a while to feel comfortable asking for help right. and accepting the help. I didn't mm -hmm. have the language of trauma or depression, mm -hmm. but we have a whole generation now um, that is experiencing something that from a developmental stage is in fact abnormal. Right. Right. Um, their socialization, right. their education, uh, yes. as well as food, right. housing, insecurity. Uh, social workers are going to be essential on the front lines. Right. But you're also going to have to teach them to care for themselves. Exactly. Because we're seeing the burnout on the front lines. Right. Right. You know, my, my son and my daughter in law are emergency flight rescue nurses um, and fly into Navajo reservations during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the exhaustion and the stress that they are feeling right mm -hmm. now um, is significant. Right. Um, but yet their commitment is deep. So how do you heal the healers of social workers? Right, is my right. question. You know, and, uh, and, and, and how do you just have enough? I mean, you know, as Lauren's describing what's happening, um, you know, in, in, the, in the household. Mm -hmm. um, and I serve on, on the board of an organization that uses teenagers to teach little kids how to read, mm -hmm. which used to happen in the classroom, right? The teenagers would leave their high school at the end of the day, and then they'd come into the public school and they would teach the little kids how to read. Um, and we had to pivot to an online mode. And it was so interesting and hard to be able to, because the, the little kids are, well, both of them are, are operating um, without adequate resources. So we had to go get computers, right? So we had to get a, additional funding to get computers, to add teachers um, so that there was a support system. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not inexpensive. Um, when I watch my, my young men in, in our Hunter Black Male Initiative Program, which is part of a CUNY-wide Black Male Initiative Program, we meet with them every Wednesday, and, and we're now obviously on Zoom, um, and we're all in our little squares. Um, and, you know, the, part of the challenge is making sure that they actually have their cameras on. Right. Um, and, you know, I understand in some cases, you know, the backdrop isn't going to be a backdrop that they want anybody to see. Right. Um, this is a friendly environment that they're offering. But I also know from my friends who are faculty that there are students who log on to their classes, don't have the camera on, and are not in the in the class at all. Right. right. right? Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, you know, um, both both you and Lauren remind me that, um, and, and I think I said this when I called you all, that I walked into my office at NASW and there's a picture of your father and there's remnants of your father. And I'm, it's like, oh my God, you know, and, and, and the last time I was there, you know, when you, when you talk about COVID and economic injustice and environmental injustice, and you talk about all racial injustice, we're coming up on a year now. It's all about action, though. And I, I keep saying, OK, what would Whitney Young do at this moment? What, what would he write in his column to tell people it's great to be on Zoom? It's great to take notes. But now what are you going to do? Right? You know, how do you get how are you going to get out 
and do something to bring about change because COVID, I mean, COVID has killed over 500,000 people. A lot of people of color. A lot of, yes, a lot. And, 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 you know, this, disproportionately, absolutely. And, and, oh, and it's, I'm, it's there without question. And what I'm finding is, you know, although they're saying there's a reluctance of people of color to take the vaccine, it is hard to get a daggone appointment. It is not, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you need computers. I mean, you, you know, it, it is something that is keeping a large majority away. So where should you know, self-work There are be? two things that are happening when you mentioned the vaccine. Mm-hmm. Um, our office did a Zoom yesterday um, with some community people uh, representing communities of color about access to the vaccine. Mm-hmm. And in Summit County, you know, which is the resort, Aspen, Vale, you know, communities, because so many of the workers are um, refugee and immigrant Latinx Mm -hmm. people, they've got a bus, they're going out to them. It's like the old bookmobiles, right? Right. I could feel my dad all over that, right? Right. Like, okay, so what are you gonna do? Um, You know, I had my shot at a pop-up inner city clinic, right? And then they mm-hmm. took pictures of us, uh, you know, just me in line with everybody else, right. you know, on their walkers waiting right. for hours to get through to get it done. Right. But a group of folks got together, they were social workers, they were volunteers, they were nurses, mm-hmm. they were doctors. And they said, what are we going to do? And now you pop up vaccination. When you think about street academies, yeah. you know, yes. That, right, which was an that was an urban league program. Program. about how do we provide if in fact folks aren't coming to you know Columbia or right. whatever else, what is it that we need to do that is community based? Right. People forget daddy's role in Head Start. It's mm. one of the things of which I am personally he, he and so his sister proud. Yes, mm. I'm so proud. I mean, Head Start today. Um, right. The role that it plays in our community. But the other thing Mitt, that you mentioned, you know, what would you do? And at the end of the March on Washington, uh, Daddy's challenge, and people forget that he spoke just before Martin. Yes, that's March right. Right. He spoke, yeah, right. he I spoke right. just yeah. before Martin. I listened to and it was a really pictures. good speech. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a great speech. He right. didn't have the big oratorial right, preacher right, voice right, for a right. big guy. His voice was a little it, lighter. No, it, was, it was a good right. speech. Yeah, right. it was a little lighter, right. but it was smart. And mm-hmm. a part of what what he ended it with was, you know, now you got to mo- march to the voting rights, right? Um, you know, to the voter registration. Now you got to march to the adult education centers. Now you got to march mm-hmm. like, the difference between symbols and substance, right? Like this was great getting us all together. Those throngs of America, all there, the rallying cries, the peacefulness. Let's remember the peacefulness Peacefulness, of that. But then afterwards he was like, you're not done. (laughs) <laughs> right? No, 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 right. No, right. This ain't over. Don't no, don't be it's thinking not over. Right. Don't, it's over. Right. don't I, don't I think one, one one of the things that's been powerful this year, and I hope we don't lose the momentum of it, um was the election. Yes, I want to talk about that. I want to talk um, about that, you know, thank God <laughs> for um for black folks. Um you know, Women. out there. And, and for Stacey Abrams. Stacey right. Abrams. Yeah. Bless yeah. Stacey Abrams. Right. Absolutely bless Stacey Abrams. But, you know, I had some of my, my students um, were out there, you know, going in and knocking on doors for voter registration. Um, uh, the League of Women Voters was going right. into communities to help us. And this was in New York. Um, but there was a sense of empowerment Mm -hmm. that I think, you know, we need to, to capture that feeling. And I think daddy would have been really all over this um, in terms of capturing that momentum and then telling people, okay, you can take that momentum and you can target in these specific ways. So you can continue to be engaged and involved and, and, and get the uplift that comes from that. 
what I'm going to ask. There's our, something let me, also, Mid. I'm sorry, but I might. I'll forget. Ahead. Right? No, no. I, I know, I'll forget I, I, if I, I don't tell say the it. audience that they can write in, start but writing. Is, okay. Uh, but I just happened to um, read the last page of his book Beyond Racism, and he warns about the threat of to democracy. Mm -hmm. And it says in parentheses, it could happen here. Right. That we could right. lose our democracy. Right. You know, he was so far ahead of his time. Oh, he was a I mean, yeah. I envy my memories of swimming with him. We used to capsize boats mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> mommy would be crying on the shore because she couldn't swim. And, you know, right. we, all those things right. up in high school. But I wish as an adult um, that I had had the opportunity to have the more um, strategic or even just mm -hmm. life right. questions. I, and like, I, 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 did, I did luck out in that, in that respect. And, right. and I'll just tell a quick story um, uh, because daddy had to navigate uh, um, his relationship with Johnson um, very mm -hmm. carefully because of the Vietnam War. And Daddy would go to Vietnam, and he would meet with the troops because he was a he was a veteran himself. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he wouldn't speak out against the war because he wanted to maintain the relationship with Johnson while they were building the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I was at Bryn Mawr, and I was taking part in, in um, sit-ins and teach-ins and and all of that stuff. Um, so he knew that I could talk about that, mm -hmm. and. At one event, um, he was sitting next to McGeorge Bundy, who was the Under Secretary of State, and um, he tells McGeorge Bundy what I thought of the war. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, um, he introduces me to McGeorge Bundy, and Daddy walks off and leaves me <laughs> <laughs> to carry right. on the conversation. Right. Um, because you know he was he was trying to help me understand that. I had to have a voice too. Right. right. And but that whatever, you know, whatever we said had to be backed up with information. Yeah. You know, we're going to start taking some um, questions, but you know, one thing that I think that your dad, or at least what, what I, when I, what I feel your dad would be saying right now is we, we just did a, a magnificent thing. Yes. In the last election. But if you look at every state house, who's, trying to pass the legislation to suppress exactly. the right to vote. It's time for social workers to organize, get all the schools of social work, get every social worker to go to those state houses to replace those individuals that need to be replaced, but to make sure that this voter suppression on all of these bills that are being placed. I mean, in, in Georgia, they have a bill that they will make it illegal for you to give food or water to anybody standing in line. I mean, that is how crazy it is going to yeah. be in two more years so that they can take it back. And I think your dad would say, OK, social workers, we've got the data. We know that we can bring change and we know that we can get the people out. But it's up to us now to not only go get as far as get a new Voting Rights Act passed again, because that needs to be done. But also you need to get into those state houses right now today. It's an emergency. because. Absolutely. Voter suppression is real. So we're going Absolutely. to, now I see Cora Jackson out here. And Cora Jackson is one of my friends. And if I don't ask this question, she's going to text me. How do we get social workers motivated to engage in grassroots efforts? Now, that's something that I just talked about with voter voting. But what, mm -hmm. what would you all say? Marcia, you work with students. Take yeah. it away. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we've been... I'd say reasonably successful and and seeing that um, young people, you know, I mean, when you think of demonstrations, you you look at those faces and they are young faces, right? Um, and so they enjoyed having the opportunity to go out and engage in voter registration. It was an active thing that they could do. And I think having, um, helping them to see where they have um, the power, where they have agency is an important thing to do. But that also means that they have to understand the value of their own voices. And if you can understand the value of your own voice, 
then you have to have some degree of self-respect. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly for our young men, helping them to appreciate that they have that, that they are entitled to having that self-respect, mm -hmm. that they have absolute you know, genius in their bones, um, but to, to allow them to feel that that power is legitimate. Okay. Thank you, Cora. I hope you got your question answered. <laughs> you know, that, that, that one lesson in life, would you give a social work, a, a young social work professional today? That, and I, I want to ask that coupled with, what is your fondest memory of your dad? Oh, you know, there's some that we share. Waffles would yes. certainly be. <laughs> Waffles would be right. The right only thing you could cook. <laughs> yeah, there are a whole bunch of food related things. Like, you know, daddy was kind of a country guy in his heart. So, you know, it was bean soup and pot roast and chili. And, you know, those were his favorite um foods and enjoyed a, a meal, uh, you know, at black restaurants. Uh, but I would say even just watching football. And when we were younger, when we got that first black and white TV, mm -hmm. Bonanza and wagon train, you know, <laughs> we, we were just like, and, and then later popcorn on night, uh, Friday night was popcorn night. We yeah. Watched television. Watch and a little thing, a little Jiffy yeah. popcorn, Jiffy popcorn, right? Jiffy, oh, no, 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 he, he was in the pot, the the pot. shaking oh, the pot. Oh, you up in the pot, pot. Oh, okay. the pot. Oh, yeah. But um, you know, and then later on, um, all in the what is it? All in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, he would yell and talk to the TV, and uh, swimming for us was definitely kind of the special. But okay. Marcia. Uh, my one of my big memories we did go to europe together mm -hmm. yes um, all of us, we did go to europe and we landed in paris i guess i know it was france and the state department was like line you know there were these cars and people as you came down the steps and he stood at the top of the steps and said bonjour you all <laughs> mother was ready to die <laughs> was like doing like this our mother was very elegant and right. reserved and kind of formal and like. academic <laughs> right um and the two of them together but i remember i was howling i got such a kick out of that bonjour <laughs> well, and, you and, all and, and and we would <laughs> daddy had a relationship with henry ford uh-oh. Uh-oh, she froze a little bit. We're, once she unfreezes, she's going to come back and tell us about Henry Ford. Here. Okay. Am I, oh, am I back? back. You're back. Yeah, you're back. Okay. <laughs> so, Daddy had this relationship with Henry. Oh, Henry Ford. There were, Henry Ford. Was car waiting. Was car. Mark. Oh, the car. Okay. Oh, Henry's the car. car. And and uh, Daddy would get get in the front seat with the sugar and Lord, and Daddy would ask to be taken to to where the people lived, right? Where where <laughs> where? And he he would try saying the ghetto, and then the uh, you know they weren't getting that at all. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he loved an experience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, well, other great memories. What is the biggest challenge in the major cities for the youth of our nation? Herman DuBose. Yeah. Cousin, oh, Herman. 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 Cousin Herman. Cousin Herman. Crack Cousin me. Herman. Uh, you answer you that know, question. Herman. I, you know this is, <laughs> yes. I, Herman's grandmother and mother dear were sisters. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's, he's. He's dogging us out of Chicago. That's what he, 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 he has. <laughs> you and he looks, has like, like, son. He looks <laughs> kind of like I think Daddy would look. Herman said he lived. Uh, okay, Herman, yes. Herman is putting it, but he wants he wants an answer. <laughs> uh, what is the biggest challenge? You know, Her Herman. I think, I think it depends, and as I've already said, mental health and the access to education mm -hmm. and the way that, um, you know, if our kids are falling back. And then I think also, I think the word implicit bias is too easy. Mm -hmm. I think it's too easy. 
but um, I think we need to call racism racism when it oh, is. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Right. <laughs> but I read a story today about a kid who went to a middle school in Indiana and had a bad haircut and had wouldn't take off his hat. And the principal who was black takes him in and says, I understand, like, it's not so hard. Just take off your hat. And the kid finally says he's embarrassed and he didn't want to take it off. So the principal goes home, gets his clippers and cleans, lines them up. Right. Mm -hmm. Under any other circumstance, that young man would have been in, in school suspension. Mm -hmm. He would have been all kinds of things. So I think pre-pandemic, just being young and black in America is hard. Right. Okay. We, all the mothers, all the fathers out there um, mm -hmm. can talk about the fear and the anxiety that we have carried for our children and our children's children. Mm -hmm. um, there, and, but, but that guy, that principal was a social worker. Mm -hmm. Right. Who ran home that educator. Right. Social work. The kid ran home, got his clippers, lined him up. Kid takes off his hat, goes back to class, is successful, feels good about himself. Mm -hmm. But um, I think this pandemic right now and the racial reckoning mm -hmm. that we're experiencing of who am I and where do I belong in the midst of all of this is going to be one of our greatest challenges. Right. And feeling okay. If you work in a grocery store, well, right. if you're in the grocery industry, right, and people are spitting at you, like right. you should be proud you've got that job. Right. You're helping right. people to get food on the table. And people aren't wearing their masks. Right. Um, right. You know, that's and we're, that's yeah, we're opening up. And, 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 and I, I've, I've served for a few years now as a judge for Goddard Riverside's um, uh, annual book awards, which means that I get a huge stack of books every summer and that's the end of my summer. Um, but <laughs> um, the one that we gave the award to this past year, which I found really profound, is called Abandoned, America's Lost Youth and the Crisis of Disconnection. Mm -hmm. And it's about our young men. It's really about the young men who are in the streets, drifting, um, have no connections. Um, you know, they're invisible to the system. And, and and then it, it turns around and offers you know strategies right. for you know the ways in which we can we can embrace them again. Right. Um, and and when you start looking at the strategies, it's like this is not brain surgery that they right. <laughs> that she's talking about, right? Right. Um, so yeah. You know the the one thing that I had predicted, and I will continue to pre to predict this, and and actually try to see if we can work to change it, is when schools do open up, they shouldn't close in the summer. <laughs> I mean, you know, sc schools need to be open for a couple of years year round so that we can catch up. And so when we talk about all this PPP money that comes up, you know, how are we going to go after our local communities, our states, and also the federal level? to keep kids in school year round because kids have lost something that will never, ever be gained back. I mean, never, right. ever and we back. need social workers. It's not right. just the teachers. Right, right. Um, exactly. They, they need to have access. Right. You know, right. if Holistic. someone, when I began to drift in college, mm -hmm. it wasn't drugs, it wasn't alcohol. Right. I got profoundly sad. Mm -hmm. Right. And sat in my room. I did smoke too many Newports. I will admit that. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll admit to that. But um, <laughs> but, you know, if someone had said to me, hey, you haven't been to class in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Right. Um, you know, how can I support you? It might have been very different. Right. Social workers are going to be essential in bridging these kids, many of whom have witnessed more domestic violence or themselves experienced abuse, mm -hmm. um, whether it's, uh, you know, emotional or verbal or, you know, whatever form, but the tensions that are existing in these households. Um, I always go back, I am the mother of sons and a daughter. I have three grandsons and a daughter. It is both and, and I've been a profound advocate. Marsha and I have done work together for black males. Mm -hmm. And by the same token, I'm deeply worried um, about moms right now. 
um, who are dropping, women are dropping out of the workforce Mm -hmm. um, in droves because they just can't handle it. Right, they have no choice, right. So uh, Tanya Thames Taylor, who is actually someone that, that I worked with at Westchester University. We have all of our fans. She's a great, she's a historian. She does great work. What book or article would you suggest we wow. read that best captures how you would view activism? You know, that's interesting. Um, I, I think going back to our father's books, I, I find myself thinking about that. I have to be quite honest, it's been a while. Um, You know, there's something about even the heart of the autobiography of Malcolm X. Like if Mm -hmm. you're going to go back um, to to the times, uh, you know, and the relationship that Daddy and Malcolm ultimately forged that people didn't recognize and the mutual respect. Today, um, I think the new Jim Crow Mm -hmm. was a pivotal uh, book within uh, our contemporary society. you know, that's an amazing question. Right. And yeah. right now, you know, even on our website at the Women's Foundation, we have an anti-racist page and the blogs right. and the things that people um, can listen to. Uh, but I might have to think about the one. That's right. a tough one. Well, you know, that... The what would you that, say, Marsha? You're reading... I. You know, that, but uh, while Marsha's saying that, that militant mediator that I was reading about, that that is a good... Book. I mean, it this, just gives you yeah. so much history. It's rich history that very few people know. So, mm-hmm. uh, Tanya, I'll give you that one. And Marsha, what do you have? Oh, gee, um, it, it is so hard. Um, uh, I think, you know, from a uh, kind of policy standpoint, um, to be equal, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, it's the it was the blueprint for the war on poverty, um, and I think it could be you know essentially timeless. Um, I, you know, I also think these days media is as important. I think one of the things I'm enjoying is seeing the proliferation of films about our history. Mm-hmm. Um, I just finished walking, watching um, uh, the story of Madam C.J. Walker, which is on Netflix. Yeah. Um, you know, the first, Chad not just the first black woman, the first woman millionaire mm-hmm. in the country. Um, so I think there are those, I think there are also some books that have to do with strategy. Um, and uh, this, there's one by Congresswoman uh, Pramila Jayapal. Um, use the power you have—a brown woman's guide to politi- to politics and political change, uh-huh. which is a real handbook for how you, you know, how you start from the ground up right. to begin to build a a political machine and and move ahead and forge that in a community. And I think this is one of those times when you know, going back to the conversation we were having earlier when I think that needs to be a handbook for those who are engaged in that work. Right. I think, um, and, and that includes the coalition building. Um, just had a conversation about my dad with the League of Women Voters in New York, right? Um, so um, right. I think the role model, the books that are role models, the books that are, are about strategy um, and just the, um, you know what's in what's in the media because I think people each need to find their own niche in terms of how they take in media, uh, how they take in information. Um, I'm I'm obviously a book person, um, but um, but you know for some it's it's going to be a film. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And, and we cannot forget Dr. Alma Carton's book that just came out. We right? cannot forget we Alma Carton's yeah. book. And, and yeah. everybody yeah. Needs to get that book. Find yeah. a way or make yeah. one. It's not off the and, press, yeah. Oxford Press. And Alma, here comes Alma's question. But they did something last night. And it, it, it I mean, it's just. I, I was stuff. there. I and saw so that. It, yes, it really needs to be another book that we have. So, Alma, let's read her question. 
such an important observation. How do we address traditional clinical practice to integrative and understanding of the mental health needs of Blacks, especially youth, now overlaid with COVID-19? Um, you know, I, I, I would say that my grandsons told me they're tired of COVID. They said, Gigi, we're tired of COVID. You know, um, they, they're ready. You know, they want it. They want they want us to come back and they, they want to see their grandparents. They want the hugs. They, they, they want the kisses, the whole bit. But as you say, they're lucky enough to have food, lucky enough to have a mom find all these things that they can go outside and play street hockey and do all of those kind of things. Yeah. But what about the child that ha you know, doesn't have all of that? My fear is that um, black kids will be, it will be pathologized. I don't know if that's a word. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Whereas, you know, as opposed to saying this is a normal response to an abnormal situation. Mm -hmm. And and if we can treat with normalcy, back to the story of the haircut. Right. This kid wasn't being oppositional. He wasn't mm -hmm. diagnosable. He needed his haircut. Right. He needed a decent haircut. Mm -hmm. So if we don't over pathologize and we meet um, with some sense of compassion. The other thing is... Um, that we haven't talked about about our dad was the domestic Marshall Plan, yes. and yeah. you know then whether you call a, you know that was affirmative into the action that, that, yeah. that's, that's what became the war on poverty it became the war on poverty and whether mm -hmm. you affirmative action or whether you think about now we'll talk about equity right. to ensure that race and gender are not social determinants mm -hmm. of outcomes within someone's life applying that equity lens. I think for our young black youth to meet them where they are and to provide mm -hmm. the tools and resources that are necessary in the moment. Your audience is much better prepared than I am, but to speak about, I can remember when folks used to say, you could tell a kid in the third grade who was gonna end up in prison, mm -hmm. That's crazy. Right? right? And my fear is that kids who come back to school will begin to be pigeonholed in certain communities. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't have, you know, technology. Right, they right. didn't have this. They were this. They were the, the them and they, them and they mm -hmm. um, kind of a narrative. And we as a country must, in fact, come together on behalf of our youth. Mm -hmm. uh, by 2050, uh, the, you know, the new emerging majority, I don't like the word minority. I never have. Right. But the new emerging majority is going to be people of color. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out how to satisfy, embrace um, our cultures, our histories, our stories, and our experiences coming right. out of out of this particular time. So as John Powell would say, you can have universal goals, but we're going to have to have some targeted strategies. Right. Most, but I think definitely. you also need, need the role models. Mm-hmm. And, mm -hmm. and the reality is that they are all around us, but they're invisible. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I did a list recently of some of the alumni from, from our Hunter Black Male Initiative program, um, which include um, a professor on the faculty at Stanford Business School, which includes, you know, somebody who's at the World Bank. Um, which, you know, I can just kind of go down this list, somebody who's at NIH and who just was named one of the top thousand black chemists in the country. Um, and again, you know, I have this little microcosm, right, of, of young people that I have known. And it's like the microcosm of the, of the students who graduated from Lincoln Institute. Multiply that, right? You know that those folks are out there. When I go on Facebook and every single day I see a post from Black Enterprise about somebody else who has just started a business mm -hmm. um, or who has just bought a business for several million dollars, um, that those stories are not lifted up sufficiently Exactly. And, the, and the moment when I when it really hit me, I did a tiny bit of work on on the uh, documentary Prison Behind Bars. Which is so, unbelievable. 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 <laughs> it is a game changer. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely it is. a game changer because Bard College treats these inmates like 
people like mm-hmm. any other bard student. Man, the right. Expectation, the, you know, it's set high and they are expected to achieve it and they do. Mm-hmm. The, the inmates beat the Harvard debate team. Right. 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 And then when they get out, they, you know, they're working at the Ford Foundation. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're, they are all over the place. Mm-hmm. The capacity is there. That is one of my favorite documentaries. Right. Well, it's it's extraordinary. I highly recommend that. Right. I saw something on food insecurity, and I think there are multiple levels. Right. Um, it is it is shameful that in this country that the level of hunger exists, mm. the amount of food that we throw away on a regular basis, the waste that exists within this country, and then the inadequate support for farmers who were then taking corn and tilling it back into the ground or burning it or whatever it was because we couldn't figure out um, how to distribute. Um, this question of land distribution, I think is really important. And, and you know, it's beyond just the community gardens. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, there's a project down the street from me that is based on a mental health model, but incorporates a garden into it as a healing element in addition to its ability to feed mm. um, right, as right. well. But, you know, the food injustices are extraordinary or the land itself is toxic right, um, right. within communities that makes it uh, impossible for us to even raise the food that's necessary. Mm-hmm. We've seen in California, I saw something, someone in New York, some amazing models, but to take it to scale, again, as a policy decision. Mm -hmm. And And, just as we, yeah. uh, And Lauren, you know, I I was, I'm glad you, you brought up the, the garden that you spoke about, because there's, um, there's a school here in New York that is um, a school, it's a second chance school for kids who have dropped out and they're coming back for a second chance. And, the principal, I was there a few years ago, so I, I'm assuming this is still true. Um, but he created a garden. And in addition to having the garden that they the kids could work in um, and plant and grow food, then he also brought in people who knew how to cook <laughs> and knew about nutrition. And, and again, it was the kind of thing that becomes really empowering to have that sense of control over a significant part of your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I belong to a food bank and we did the same thing. We actually bought a big, big, big area and then built a nice kitchen and then brought people who were uh, released from jail or who could not find a job, hired a chef that taught, the, taught everybody, had classes, placed them into the various restaurants here in Chester County. and actually sustained in their job. There, there, there's good things to be done. Um, I think the pandemic has actually exposed food insecurity in the United States. You know, you know people for the very first time who've never asked for help before. I've been on this kick recently about um, why people wear dirty masks is because with an EBT card, you can't buy taxable items. You can't buy anything, right? So ha- how are you going to buy? You things? taught me that. Yes, I did. I did. You I- taught me that. I did not know that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So when, when, you, when, when we have these things, but you know what? Right now is the time to change, right? Because right. Everything, as your father talked about, it's about strategic opportunities, right? Um, so if we sit here and wait and, and and then ask to change EBT cards and 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 make sure that people can buy things that will, they can clean themselves with and all of the things that they need, if we could do it right now, that makes people think or the legislators think, well, I never really thought about that, but it's necessary. That's how you bring about change. And when I look at all the change that your father did, it was always strategic. It was always kind of uh, like he saw a problem. He identified the problem like we're taught in social work. And then he strategically worked his way in to everybody that dealt with that problem all the way to the boardrooms, to the Henry Fords, to all the people that had money, to American Express. And he used his powers of persuasion. 
mm-hmm. to convince Absolutely. people to invest Absolutely. in people, right? That's um, exactly right. And, 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 and showing examples. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, because sometimes the solutions that he had were very simple and in front of your face. Mm-hmm. You know, like saying to the department stores, if you have more black salespeople, you're going to have more black customers. Right. Yeah, you know, that would seem obvious. All right. Um, and I think we're in a moment. Um, and I think my dad was an optimist, and I've, I've acquired that tendency myself. Um, uh, I think people, there are people of goodwill who are looking for what they can do. And I was talking to a group um, of, you know, sort of not Unitarian, sort of cross between Unitarian and Quaker. <laughs> um, uh, not far from you, Matt. Um, uh-huh. Uh, we, we were doing it on Zoom, obviously, but um, they were talking about having this, you know, about literacy, and then they were talking about having their uh, community garden and and the, the um, their store, and and so I said, well, what if you put a library in that community kitchen? Mm-hmm. Um, what if that happened? Well, I got an email not too long ago. Guess what? They, put they the did that. Yes, right. They yeah. did that. All right. Right. You know, it's one of the things, things, one of the things, uh, well, two elements of hope, and we all know that hope is it, it's, the it's most, true. hope is everything. Right. But the two most critical elements for hope, and maybe this goes back to these young people and getting them engaged, is that you have to have a sense of agency, as Marsha was saying, voice. Mm-hmm. You have, And then you need a plan. Mm-hmm. Right, um, and that plan can be very simple. Mm-hmm. It can be very, very simple. It doesn't have to be overly complex, um, but you have to have a sense of of the agency and a plan. Right. Um, and if we can build idea. an oh. idea, yeah. Oh. And you also have to recognize that you know a failure is not the failure. Exactly. It's right, not. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right, right. Everything you're not going to be good at everything, but you go ahead and you try, right? You know, you you try ideas and you make sure. Now, um, questions came by phone. What was your father's relationship with Dorothy Height like, and how did the two social workers work together? Well, I think my dad and and I I had the good fortune of of um, spending a little time with Dorothy a couple of years before she died, which was a real honor. Um, that they, there was a lot of mutual respect. Now we have, I think you have to understand that, um, you know, my dad was old school from the standpoint that, um, even having his mother and his sisters being the powerhouse that they were, he could still be chauvinist, mm-hmm. right? Because that's what, you know, that's then. Um, and, and, you know, encouraging me to, to do stuff and encouraging Lauren to do stuff. Um, but he had enormous respect for Dorothy and Dorothy's job was to make sure that women were out there, um, and making change, but change was, that was essentially supportive, that it was still a perceived as a supportive role, um, to, you know, to, to the big six or the big five. Um, and, um, you know, so he had a good relationship with her and she, and she talks about, and she talked about that, that relationship, but it was, it was in the context of that moment in terms of gender relationships in yeah. power. Yeah. I mean, John Lewis, um, you know, isn't always included in the big six because he was young. Dorothy right, Height right. wasn't always included because she was a woman. The story and of the Bayer wasn't included at all because right. he was gay. Right. Yeah, Bayer's um, from my area, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right, you know. Right, right. So, so uh, there was not perfection. Let right. you know. Let's be really clear in the <laughs> equitable approach to leadership at that time. Mm-hmm. But I have no doubt that if he were alive today, that he would be embracing um, all of those who are experiencing or have experienced uh, systemic and historic oppression. Um, There is no question about that. 
I also see here, um, there's a question about, uh, it looks like uh, giving cash, um, people, cash allocations to families. The Women's Foundation of Colorado, we gave close to a million dollars, about 780,000 for COVID relief to 108 uh, organizations in 64 counties throughout the state, about $10,000 each. And we gave to intermediary organizations that were um, providing cash assistance. There's been a fair amount of study that has been done that um, cash assistance from, from a poverty busting perspective can be extremely effective. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we do so often is we'll say, well, when you've had um, this financial class or when you've had financial, well, it's like if I don't have a 401k and an insurance policy and all this stuff to be developing a financial plan, but I'm trying to put food on the table right. and keep my kids warm. Why can't we trust individuals? It's kind of like, um, you know, food stamps. Exactly. You hear the stories of the exploitation, right? right. They all get blown up. Somebody bought, right. tried to buy caviar or whatever right. it might have been. But you were the one who told me that they can't get a rotisserie chicken. Right. That rotisserie chicken and the dirty mask, right. um, I had not realized. We can trust people to make good decisions. They need the resources with which to do that. Right. And if I, mistakes I, are made, mistakes are made. Um, I, but why do we think that folks, what is a mistake? What is exactly. that learning experience? What is a mistake? Just like any one of us, um, I can look back on things that I have done financially. Otherwise, like that wasn't my best idea. All right, um, right. But I don't repeat it. Right. <laughs> and, you, and you learn from them. You learn from them. You know what I want? I, 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 I served on, on the board of, of the Trickle Up program, which does, um, it's no longer in the U.S., but um, was global. And it would give grants of $50, two $50 grants. Um to the poorest of the poor, typically normally women mm -hmm. in around the world, right? Um, to start a business. And as long as, you know, as long as they showed that they had, you know, earned a profit and on that first $50, then they got the second $50, right? right? And in some parts of the world, that was enough to send a child to school that they could, you know, earn enough money to send a child to school. And it was no strings attached. Mm. All you had to do was show that, you know, you made a profit and then you get the next check. I mean, it's just like nonprofits, you know, philanthropy is now recognizing um, through COVID that you can do rapid grants that don't require, you know, 10 page mm -hmm. applications and you don't need 20 page evaluation reports. Um, that you can do a trust-based uh, philanthropy of unrestricted general operating dollars to help people do the work. And right. we all know that those who are um, most connected to the experience, you have to have people with lived experience within the context of the work, that that makes a difference. Um, you know, there's micro lending, but we also support uh, a group called Sistabiz right. that right. trains Black women entrepreneurs, and they're amazing. My executive assistant also has a side business mm -hmm. that I love because right. it's for natural hair. Right, um, right, my right. barber shop, I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, right. similarly, um, you know, my barber uh, who owns the shop, young guy in his 30s, has small insurance, health insurance policies mm -hmm. for his shareholders. They have a food bank. He's now looking to become a pop-up vaccination site. Oh, wow. Marcia, you met Marcus. Right. Uh, yes, absolutely. You absolutely. Town. Yeah. La and, ladies. You know, people yeah. people know what to do. Exactly. People, people, <laughs> pe I mean, that's, the, that's it. if we help people, 
they can help themselves. That's what it's all about. You know, ladies, this has been an hour and a half. I feel like we just got started and it's almost time to say goodbye. And I really want to thank both of you. Thank you. It, it was a fun, thank it, was, thank it was through our geography of who we knew and how we knew that we got in touch <laughs> with each other. Um, and we will always, you know, be friends. Uh, I, I owe you all a drink and dinner uh, when I'm in the New York area. And I'm also uh, out I'll, there. I'll let you know next life. time I'm at Bryn Mawr. Okay. Yeah. yeah We're on the K, you know, yeah. Uh, and, and Marcia you know, goes to Cambridge. So right. He goes to Boston. Right. So where where is Mark? He's not in Boston. What's that town? He's, he's he, um, my my son Mark, who's in in Situate, Mass. He's just south Situate. of Boston. That's it. Well, and, and I, just just to to give um, a statement about you know the continuing of this legacy, his daughter, his oldest daughter, um, started the first. ACLU chapter in her predominantly white high school. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. And she's uh, 17. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Bye, Whitney Herman. Young, we love you. Whitney Young's Thank legacy. You. His legacy lives on because of the two of you, uh, the work that he did, his grandparents, your grandparents and your great grandparents. I humbly say thank you to all, thank to you. You all for being thank here. You. We thank thank you. all of you. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. you you for what we, you well, Lauren and I haven't spent this much time together. <laughs> I know. So, that, is, that is going to be a hundred years old on the 31st of July. So we have to That's celebrate. That's right. right. Yes, yes, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. You have, you have, you have to have, have your daughter make, make one of those caramel cakes. Oh, she okay. does it really well. I, I heard Ooh. that caramel cake. Yes. <laughs> all yeah. right, everybody. Yeah. We say thank you. Thank you, enjoy thank you all so much. Thank you. And thank you, Greg and Aaliyah, for being the producers. And we'll see you at the next chat in March. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.